this year, Pastor KK. You are a man of different parts and an extraordinary gentleman, and uh, uh, your thoughts uh, on this conference are great. So I trust that uh, we will be a blessing to you and your, uh, and your team and the people who have gathered uh, under this ministry. Uh, Pastor KK is one of my uh, favorite pastors, uh, is, uh, an exciting person, very intense, uh, very energetic, and very vision-focused, and uh, he continues to do exploits for God and thank God for his life and the life of his wife, Esther, uh, and the great team who are with him uh, doing the work of the ministry, and uh, we are very confident that the Lord will do great things uh, with him in the years ahead, with them in the years ahead, and, and perform his word in their lives. Um, this year, I, I, from what I gather, we are looking at uh, all the challenges that will face us within the, the period that we are in, uh, rising uh, to take risks, uh, facing our fears, turning adversity to opportunity, all these concepts that are important to where we are in the world. Of course, if you've been on this planet for the last uh, year and a half and more, uh, you would know that the normal has given way to the uh, unusual. We are in unusual uh, season. So I'm going to talk about what to do in a season of harvest. What to do in a season of harvest. I believe that we are in a season of harvest and uh, it may not appear so, but we are. What to do in a season of harvest. Our world has seen some extraordinary things happen, but I believe that uh, in the midst of all the apparent chaos and distortion, uh, God has brought us into a season of harvest, and I'm going to look at uh, that concept. So there are two passages I'm going to uh, anchor what I speak about on. And they are both statements made by Jesus. One of them is in the Gospel of St. Luke. And the other is in the Gospel of St. Matthew. So Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. And these are words that Jesus spoke to the 70 when he sent them to the mission field. And this is what Jesus said, Luke, 20, Luke chapter 10, verse 2 and 3. Then he said to them, the harvest truly is great but the laborers are few therefore pray the lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest go your way behold i send you out as lambs among wolves and then matthew chapter 10 verse 16 um it says something similar, but expands the concept a little bit more. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. These two statements were made by Jesus, and both of them were related to sending his disciples or his people to the harvest field or to the field or to the mission field. The first one uh, in Luke, he made it when he was sending the 70 to the mission field. And the second one, the Matthew statement, he made it when he was sending the 12 to the mission field. So both statements have a logic to them. Both are related to a mission both are related to a harvest. Both two are related to an opportunity that has opened up for the propagation of the gospel. 
When Jesus was alive, his mission was to reach to what he called the lordship of the house of Israel. That was his immediate ministry. Of course, after his death, the wall of partition between Israel and the Gentiles, the Gentile nations was removed. So the gospel went beyond Israel to the rest of the world, reaching to us and to other people. But when Jesus was alive, the mission to the Gentile was not the priority. The priority was mission to the lordship of the house of Israel. However, Jesus indicated that when he uh, died and, and rose and went to heaven, the disciples will have to take his mission beyond the house of Israel. And when they went beyond the house of Israel, they became sheep among wolves. When they were ministering in Israel, they were ministering to sheep. When they went out from outside Israel to the nations, to the Gentile nations, they were sheep among wolves wolves. So Jesus Christ used the harvest fields of his time, the harvest field of his era, as metaphors for the souls that will come to the kingdom of God. That is the context of these two passages. However, today I will apply the same metaphor of Jesus to other fields of endeavor. So the principle is the same for soul winning as it is for other areas of our lives. So I'm going to still use harvest field, but I'm not going to limit it to soul winning, although it includes soul winning because part of the opportunities God has given us this time is to win souls for his kingdom. But it also includes church growth, expansion, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean souls being saved. It, it may mean building bigger bands, build a bigger churches so that the souls will be taken care of. The context is the same, uh, but there will be a little difference. So what do I mean by a harvest or a season of harvest? A harvest is a field of opportunity. A harvest is a field of opportunity. Field opportunity. So when we say in between is off, but the two words I want you to take note of is field and opportunity. So when we say there is a harvest, we are talking about God has opened a field to you and that field gives you opportunity. So when Jesus sent his disciples to the harvest, he was sending them to a field, a field is a space you operate in, is a space. So when, when we say that God has brought us to a field, it means that he has created space for us. He has made room for us. And in that space, there is opportunity. So he says, I send you to the harvest, to the field, to the space of opportunity. And in that space of opportunity, Jesus talks about two major challenges in the field or in the space of opportunity. When we come to our field of opportunity, there will be two major challenges that Jesus talks about. And I will be focusing on those two challenges uh, for the rest of my time speaking. The first challenge that Jesus spoke about is that the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So the first challenge is the challenge of laborers. Laborers. So God gives us a field. He opens the door. He gives us a huge opportunity. But he says that within that opportunity, there is a challenge. And the first challenge is laborers. The challenge of laborers is twofold. The first one is the challenge of skills. Of course, you don't go to the harvest as a laborer and just weed anyhow. Because if you do that, you're going to uh, collect other stuff that is not 
the fruit of your harvest into your harvest field. So there is, there is a lot of skill, skill of discernment, uh, knowing the difference between what is wheat and what is tares, what is corn and what is not corn, what is a good harvest and what is not a good harvest. So skill is so required in the by laborers. And the second one is strength. So in your harvest field, God says that there is a shortage of laborers. And the shortage is expressed in shortage of skills and shortage of strength. Anytime God gives you a big opportunity, you're going to realize that there is a skill limitation. And then there is a capacity, there is a strength limitation, the labor limitation. So, uh, many times in, in ministry, you, you see God brings us to a big space where he opens a big door. And then we realize that the laborers, the people we are with, the people who are working with us, have limited skills and limited strength. God puts you on the world stage, but the skill, the laborers, are at the village stage. And their strength is very, very limited. Most of the time, the people are so tired because they've worked so hard to get to the harvest. And by the time they get to harvest, they're so tired, they can't push any longer. And that is why many times in harvest fields, there is a change of laborers. There shouldn't be, but sometimes there is because skill levels are low and strength is also low. So Jesus says that's the first thing you're going to face when God gives you opportunity. Now, in this season, one of the things we are beginning to notice is that there is great opportunity for churches to reach beyond uh, the physical gathering of people. It's one thing having a crowd gather in front of you and minister to them. And then another thing having a crowd not in front of you and you ministering to them. Um, and the skill required for this harvest of souls outside of a meeting room is very different from the skills required when people are present. When people are present, you can pray for them, you can lay hands on them. When people are not present, you can't lay hands on them. As a matter of fact, even as a church grows, you can skills change. When I was pastoring a smaller congregation, I, I could have services where I would lay hands on everybody. But what do you do when you have 20,000 people in a meeting or 50,000 people in a meeting or 100,000 people in a meeting? You cannot lay hands on 100,000 people. That would take your lifetime of laying on of hands. So skill of impartation will be very different from the skills of impartation when you have a smaller crowd and the strength is very different. So that's the first challenge. And I, I'll just read to you a, a passage from Isaiah chapter 37 verse 3. Isaiah 37 verse 3. But they said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble and rebuke. And blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. The children have come to birth. The children are ready. The child is in the womb. This is the ninth month. The child has turned properly. The child has to be delivered, but there is no strength. So the child is creating the opportunity of birth. The mother must have the strength to take advantage of that opportunity. So when God brings us to a harvest, there will be labor. There will be labor to receive the fruits of our seeds sown. There is labor. As a matter of fact, there's the, the, the kind of strength required at harvest is greater than the strength at planting because one person can plant a field but one person cannot harvest a field because 
what it takes to plant a field is less than what it takes to harvest a field. So, there will be labor shortage, skill shortage, strength shortage. And for all of you who are pastors listening to me or who work in churches and are church leaders, your skill level has to be uplifted. You have to learn new skills, new abilities to function in this new opportunity. Second challenge. So the first one is laborers. The second challenge that Jesus says we're going to face in the harvest field is the challenge of wolves. This is a dangerous one. First one, there is labor challenge. Internal, that's your own internal challenge, capacity to build, to take advantage of the harvest. Second one is wolves. Wolves are not internal, although sometimes they are. <laughs> there are internal wolves, but mostly it's external, external, external pressure. This is what Jesus said. I send you as lambs among wolves. That is in Luke. In Matthew, he says, I send you as sheep among wolves. Both lambs and, sh and sheep are the same. The sheep is generic. The lamb is, uh, is the baby sheep. Uh, the wolf is the same. So, Jesus says you're going to feel like you are sheep among wolves. Now, when you present sheep to wolf, the sheep become vulnerable. The sheep become weak to the attacks of the wolf. So Jesus is basically saying that your harvest will expose you to danger. Exposure to danger. It's like a, a pastor who ministers, says whatever he likes in front of his congregation. His church loves him. And then he goes on television and he says the same thing his church loves. And the people outside of his church hate him for it. So he has come into a big harvest. He's exposed to a bigger harvest, but in that exposure, there is danger where immaturity will show up, where your gifts not properly developed will become a liability to you. So the harvest is filled, is, is, is great, but it's going to give you wolves, exposure to danger. Wolves are not the friends of sheep. They attack and they attack sometimes in the open and sometimes they attack in secret as wolves in sheep's clothing. So sometimes they look like you, but then they function differently against you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 8 and 9, the apostle Paul says, but I'll tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost for a great and effective door has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. Now, if you know uh, what happened to Paul when he was in Ephesus, when he got to Ephesus, uh, he, he started preaching and uh, he upset the, the work of the, uh, of the tradesmen because uh, the tradesmen who make the uh, statues for the gods of Ephesus, especially Diana or Artemis of Ephesus, were upset by the ministry of, uh, of Paul and raised up people against him. So a great door of opportunity has been opened to Paul, but his ministry is upsetting the economy based on idolatry. So people whose businesses thrive on idolatry are now attacking Paul. So they are the wolves. They are the wolves, the external 
attack that comes because your harvest field has intruded into their territory. So, that's what wolves are. Wolves are adversaries. They stand between you and your open doors. And a few characteristics of wolves. First, they are hunters. They are hunters. You don't, they don't do well as pets. <laughs> they are hunters. They, these guys are very ferocious. Secondly, they attack at night. Attack at night. So they attack when you're not alert. When you are resting. When you are taking it easy. When you are enjoying a nap. That's when they come on the attack. So they are hunters. They are always looking for a weakness to exploit. And they attack at night. And the third thing is that they are strong. They are strong. Very strong jaws. And the fourth, this is very important. They are territorial. Anytime God gives you a harvest, it is going to intrude in a wolf's territory. A territory that used to be for somebody is going to be lost. And the wolf is not going to just stand and smile because you're taking their territory. They don't take kindly to lost territory. So they are hunters. They go on the attack at night when you're asleep, when you're not alert. They are strong and they're territorial. Sheep, on the other hand, are peaceful. So sheep, peaceful. Just much peaceful with hunter. It's not a good combination. <laughs> It's not good. When somebody is a hunter and you are peaceful, you are in danger. Sheep operate in the day. That's the advantage. So, so as long as they stay in the day, they are active. They sleep at night. So they work at, in the day, sleep at night. These guys sleep in the day, work at night. So whilst you're working, they're relaxing, waiting for when you are not working. So if you, if you put that together, they are suited to the lifestyle of the sheep. Because they can attack the sheep in the daytime. The sheep trust in the shepherd. They follow a shepherd. So far as the sheep trust in the shepherd and work in the shepherd, with the shepherd, they can deal with the strength of the wolf. And the last one, it's both a strength and a weakness, is the sheep are migratory. Migratory. They move from place to place and these guys tend to stay in one place. The advantage of it is that when you are operating as sheep in God's field, you have to move. You have to have the capacity to migrate. You have to have the capacity to do new things. So when people are chasing you in a territory, you're looking for new territories that God is opening for you. But whatever it is, the strength of the sheep and the strength of the wolf are not equal. And in that situation, the sheep is always vulnerable. I've always wondered, why did God send us into opportunities when we don't have the strength? Why are we vulnerable in our day of opportunity? How is it that when God opens a door, when there is a big door open, we just find, 
we don't have the skills, we don't have the strength, and we have ferocious enemies that want to destroy us. That is the reason why many people never take advantage of opportunity. That is why a lot of people never rise to the big stage because the harvest field is going to expose you to danger. It's one of the reasons why Africa is poor where we are because we're not able to play big on the international scale because we have wolves there who are trying to get rid of us. And apart from that, we don't have the skills and the strength to take advantage of our harvest. And that is why we can have a lot of oil, but not refine. A lot of gold, but not refine. A lot of bauxite, but not create iron. And even when we create raw materials, we don't build the factories because the skills required to operate at those levels are not available. So in your harvest field, skill is important, labor is skill and strength. But the external danger, the wolves, will also come against you. I think that the season we are in, 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 in the world at this time, favors the church. But at the same time, it is also putting the church in conflict with major ideas in the world. And, and as the church grows, these are the conflicts we have to deal with. So if Jesus says to his disciples, I send you as sheep among wolves, how are they supposed to survive? How are they supposed to survive in this unfriendly world? In Matthew's comment, Jesus added a proviso. Matthew 10, 16, go back to it and it says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Because you're going to face these wolves. Therefore, therefore means because of that. Because you are sheep amongst wolves. Therefore, so he knows the world we're going to go into. He knows what opportunity is going to bring us into. He knows the risks. He knows the adversity. He knows the challenge. And then he tells us because of that, this is how I want you to behave. Quite an interesting thing. So he doesn't say because you're going to face wars, therefore, Run away from the harvest. No, he says, still go to the harvest as sheep before wolf. But this is the strategy. Be as wise as serpents. The operative word is wise. He didn't say be as serpents. That's not what he said. He didn't say because you're going to face wolves, just act like a serpent. No. He says because you're going to face wolves, be wise as serpent. The only characteristic of the serpent that Jesus is recommending is wise. He didn't say be destructive or bite like the serpent. Or attack or whatever. He says be wise as serpents. A very limited analogy. It's not an open analogy where you develop a serpentine behavior. Because you are in combat zone with wolves. Therefore be as wise as serpents. So what does it mean to be wise as serpents? When we are dealing with wolves. Now if you know the serpent. Serpent doesn't have legs. So it's always on the ground. The serpent has. A lot of weaknesses. It doesn't have legs. Its stomach is very vulnerable. If it turns its stomach to you. 
It's dead. So how does the serpent manage its inherent weaknesses? It hides in rocks. It doesn't have strength of its own, but it takes advantage of systems that will protect it. That's the rock. So the wisdom of the serpent is that it is able to take advantage of systems that protect it. It hides itself in rocky places. We must learn to build systems that protect us from those who hate to see the righteous prosper. We have to build those systems. Some of those systems may be academic systems. They could be legal systems. They could be administrative systems. The world wants to get us. Let's not give ourselves up to them. The world is attacking our belief system. Let's not be ignorant people. We have to be wise people. We have to be informed people. We have to be astute people. We have to be intellectual people. We cannot face a skeptic world with foolishness. So Jesus says you have to be as wise as serpent. The serpent does not turn its belly to the enemy. We must learn the art of keeping our weaknesses from those who will capitalize on them. Be as wise as serpent. Because you're going to face these people. You have to protect yourself. You have to learn to hide from their attacks. Ensure that they can't get you. You're still sheep with wolf. But the sheep must not behave like sheep. That's what Jesus is saying. Why does Jesus know, uh, say that the sheep must not therefore be sheep? Because sheep in the days of Jesus were considered to be, quote and unquote, stupid, dumb. They follow to the slaughter. If, you, if, if you're going to kill the sheep, it just follows to the slaughter, doesn't complain. Jesus says, don't follow to the slaughter. Don't have, you are sheep, but don't behave like the sheep. Be wise, protect yourself, hide from destruction. Then he says, whilst you are being wise as a serpent, he gives us a balance as innocent, as a dove. He's balancing the serpent with the dove. Wise and innocent. Wise and pure of heart. Keep an upright spirit. Walk in wisdom and discernment. See beyond your present opportunity. Whilst you've been wise, don't become like a wolf. Be honest, be pure, be prudent. And that's what Jesus says. If you're able to balance these, you can survive the wolves. Whether you function as a pastor, as a businessman, as a politician, Wherever we function as Christians who have been given opportunity, if we want to use that opportunity to advance the kingdom of God, the values of God, the principles of God, then this is how Jesus says we do it. If we don't do it that way, then we may be very influential, but we will become like wolves. And unfortunately, if Christians 
whether we are believers in politics or pastors or wherever we are, develop the characteristics of wolf, we hunt our own sheep. Sometimes you would see pastors who are wolves in their church and attack their own flock and destroy their flock. In the midst of opportunity, sometimes pastors can be wolf to other pastors. So instead of we advancing the kingdom of God, we tear down the kingdom of God. Sometimes in business, instead of encouraging others to rise, we destroy everybody within our space because we have become wolves instead of sheep. So Jesus gives us the blueprint. The harvest indeed is plenty. The fields are wide. But there are dangers in the way. And I, I feel one of the big dangers the church is going to face in the future is the challenge to our faith. There is a generation of Christians who will not be affected because they are, they've been Christians for a long time. They've served the Lord for 20, 30, 40 years. My generation, people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, even maybe 50s, they will be fine. But our children who are teenagers and young in a school system exposed to all the knowledge of the world will have their faith challenged. And though their parents will retain their faith, a young generation are going to have wolves attack their faith. Therefore, if we want the faith of our children to stand, we must be wise. We must be wise. They're going to be hard and tough questions. And that's why I believe that every Christian leader in our time, if they want the next generation to survive and the generation after them to survive, must study Christian apologetics, the defense of our faith, why we believe the Bible is the word of God, why we believe Jesus is the son of God. Why we believe that there is a God. All these fundamental things we take for granted now have to be proven to a skeptical world. Proven intellectually. Proven scripturally. Proven spiritually. We cannot just prove it spiritually. With miracles and signs and wonders. We also have to prove it scripturally. Because of the word of God. And then we have to prove it intellectually. Because we must defeat all the arguments. That come against the preaching of the gospel. That's what the apostle Paul labored for. Intellectually. Scripturally. Spiritually. The same internet we are using to preach the gospel Social media we're using to preach the gospel is also smuggling new lifestyles in and we have to be wise as serpents. Otherwise, we become like the Christians of a previous generation who told others, don't watch the television, don't listen to radio and shut them off. We cannot be shut off. We must be like Daniel who was wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove, in the courtyard of King Nebuchadnezzar. He survived the most difficult intrigues in the field that God has opened to him. In his harvest field, eventually Nebuchadnezzar bowed and said, there is no God than the God of Daniel. There is no God than the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were people who were in the harvest field were they few? Yes. But they were strong and they were skillful. And when they were tested, 
they were 10 times better than the Babylonians because in that field, they survived. So my counsel to all the pastors, especially those of you who are young pastors, you have to put in some hard labor. Hard labor, hard intellectual labor. Get some theological training. Studies theology. Even if you don't do it in an academic setting, be conscious about your theological formation and your intellectual formation because we are in wolf territory. Because their harvest is taking us to wolf territory and we have to defend the authority of the gospel. Be wise as serpents, as innocent as doves. In the business world, we're going to see Christians compete with businesses at all levels. Isn't it disheartening that the richest people of the world at this time don't have Christians? Most of them are totally anti-Christ. 50 years ago, 60 years ago, the richest people of the world were all Christians. They were tithers. There were people who would say, the reason I'm rich is because I tithe and I give and God is priority. 50, 60, 70 years ago, the standard of prosperity was scriptural. Now we have a new generation and they have ring fence Christianity because they've taken Christianity out. Now we need Christians who will be sheep and enter the wolf's territory to be wise and to be innocent. And then we're going to need Christians who venture into the political space, especially if you are in Nigeria and you want to go into politics. It's one of the most difficult spaces to survive in. The wolves are big wolves, mighty wolves. But we can't leave that space to the wolves. We have to go into that space. We are sheep in our harvest field of politics. And we have to be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. I believe God is going to push the frontiers of the church into all these spaces. Into the political space, into the business space. And I'm not just talking about Christians operating some small transport business. That's good. And operating some big business, some small business there. I mean, there, there are people who are making billions whose wealth is, is more than nations. And that is where we need to be. We need Christians who would get to those commanding heights of the economy. And they're going to face some wolves. But if we follow the formula of Jesus, we're going to be wise as serpents. We're going to be innocent as doves. We can play in that field and win in that field. So, in this season of a harvest, Jesus gives us the blueprint for overcoming in a very, very negative environment. And I pray that the Lord will give each one of us the wisdom uh, to not only survive, but thrive and overcome and be the best. Father, thank you for every man and woman, every pastor. Man of God, woman of God, listening to me. Whom you have called to the mission field. Some in church planting. Some to take church beyond church. Church into politics. Church into business. They're going into new fields. They're going to new harvest fields. They're, they're, they're going out to a world that is negative. And you showed us that they will face wolves. And you say that sometimes we may not have the skills and the strength. But today we speak the release of the Holy Spirit upon every pastor, every man of God, every woman of God who is seeking to break loose from a harvest field to another harvest field. May you give them the right skills and the right laborers and give them the wisdom of the serpent and the pure heart of a dove. That they can go into the world and not be contaminated by the world. We pray, Lord, for an upsurge of your power, an explosion of your power, an explosion of your glory. Use your people in extraordinary ways and do something marvelous and great in our sight. 
in Jesus name Amen. 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 Amen well thank you so much for participating in this seminar and being part of what is going on and for all the speakers who are speaking uh, may the Lord use this knowledge to build up a new cater of Christians who will go out and do something great for the Lord. Uh, may our territory never be limited. May our boundaries never be limited. May our fields grow from strength to strength. May the Lord use us abundantly in our time. Thank you so much, Pastor KK. Thank you for uh, this opportunity and, for, and with your wife, for Esther, and, and, the, and the team and everybody else who has been part of this. May this be our greatest moment in history. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And uh, we we'll hope to see you one more time sometime in the future. God bless you. Let's, let's give him praise. Everybody lift up your two hands. Receive grace. Pray it in. Pray it in. Pray it in. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Somebody pray it in. Somebody pray it in. Lebrados. Legredos. We give you praise. I want you to pray it in. Mendrebos Sotoligeros. Hebros. Pray, pray, pray. Receive grace massively. Lebracatos. Yembregos. Mendrebos Sotoli. Lebracatos. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. One minute, let's receive grace. One minute, let us receive grace. One minute, let us receive grace. One minute, let us receive grace. Oh, Jesus. One minute, let us receive grace. One minute, let us receive grace. Lebracatu se breketo. In Jesus' precious name. Ladies and gentlemen, join me. Let's celebrate Dr. Mensah Otabi. We can do better. We can do better. Oh my God, we can do better. We can do better. Amen. Somebody look at your neighbor and whisper to your neighbor, what a word. Can you say it quickly to another neighbor? Can you still say it quickly to another neighbor? Our harvest field is there. But there are wolves. The harvest field is there, but there are wolves. Of course, limited laborers. Lack of skill and no strength. Let's pray. Lord, make me fit for the harvest. And number two, send right laborers to me. Shall we lift up our two hands and pray? In the name of Jesus, let's pray, let's pray. Let's pray, let's pray. Le credo cigar. Let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. Precoce soto libri and the adult. Le Breketo Abrakosh. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Mangrabo Sotoligish. Le Brakoti Ade. Mangrabo Sotoligish. Le Brondo Sotoli Akrash. Precoti Ade Karos. We give you praise. In Jesus' precious name, I'm thinking our amen will be the loudest. The harvest field is there. Wolves are there. But he still told us to go. 
We must not turn back because we have challenges. Difficulties shouldn't discourage us. Nothing should discourage us. Nothing should discourage us. We won't turn back in battle in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And he said, for that to be a reality, be wise as serpents, be innocent as doves. Lift up your two hands, God's precious people. Repeat after me, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive grace to be wise as serpents and innocent as dove. Let's pray it in the name of Jesus. Embrados, Lebrados Sotoligeros. Lebra Koshi Andres Lembra Kotus Legredo Soto Legara Mengre Bosos mm. Quickly, one more minute Just one more minute, one more minute One more minute Lebra Kosic Precotia Agas one more minute. Pray, 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 pray. The grace of God is moving. The wisdom of God is moving. This is the best way to end the year and enter into a new year. Upsurge of wisdom. Upsurge of grace. Upsurge of God's blessings. Upsurge of skill. Mangraboso. Leprendo siya agataka. In Jesus' precious name. Together, let's lift up our hands and give him all the glory. Let's thank him, let's thank him, let's thank him. Shall we go ahead and bless his name? Shall we go ahead and give him all the glory? Shall we go ahead and give him all the honor? Shall we go ahead and give him all the adoration? Let's bless his name for his faithfulness. Let's bless his name for his mercies. Let's bless his name for his loving kindness. Let's worship him in the beauty of holiness. Let's thank him. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Finally, God just ministered this to me. He said, give them two minutes to speak over their life. Please don't pray. You will just be speaking over your life. In the mighty name of Jesus, because of wolves, I will not turn back from my adverse field. Don't pray, but be speaking over your life that in the mighty name of Jesus, I have the right wisdom, the right skill. <laughs> in that name of Jesus Christ, effectual doors are open to me. I won't turn back from my door because of adversaries. Speak over your life. I will not be discouraged. Speak over your life. I want you to speak definite words over your life. I possess my harvest field for Christ. 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 Nothing will make me turn back. Nothing. One more minute, one more minute. Le credo siada. Me grebo soto liga. Preke siada. Le bracoshis. Le prodose. Embracata. Le cates. Le credo siadis. In Jesus' precious name. Let's just wave our two hands and bless his name. And give him all the glory and give him all the honor and give him all the adoration. We bless your name, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' precious name. Is something good happening to somebody already? Are you having an upsurge experience? Are you having an upsurge experience? Shall we put our hands together and be seated? Hallelujah.